If you could reinvent the entire internet, starting all over again with security in mind, what would you do? You're listening to Defense in Depth. Welcome to Defense in Depth. My name is David Spark. I am the producer of the CISO series. And joining me as always is Alan Alford. Our sponsor for today's episode is Castle. You're going to learn a lot more about them later in the show. But first, Alan, introduce our topic. It is about securing a brand new internet. Explain. I asked a very straightforward question. I think you already put it in the title. Just if you could reinvent it from scratch, what would you do? I think we all know there are inherent security flaws in the internet as it stands today. Things that, you know, we, we layer a fix and a new flaw is discovered and we layer a fix and a new flaw is discovered. And what if we could reimagine it from the get-go and see if we couldn't fix it up? And, and I want to I couch one thing too. When I define the internet in this post, my thinking, my intention was that the internet is sort of a combination of two things. First of all, it's the TCP IP protocol suite. And second of all, it's a network where public traffic traverses privately held routers in a dynamic fashion all over the world. There's also an inherent degree of anonymity, which I was not originally thinking about when I posted. You'll see that come up. And I just wanted to point out one thing in particular as well is that, you know, BGP as a protocol, I kind of had in mind when I wrote this as well. Okay. Well, the reason we're doing this, and by the way, I literally lifted your question from directly from your post at the beginning of this podcast. The reason we're having this is I ran into Davi Ottenheimer, who we've had on the show before when I was doing my live recording uh, in front of the audience in New York. And Davi was telling me about the work he's now doing with Tim Berners-Lee at Inrupt. And he has been tasked with the job of securing this new internet that Tim Berners-Lee wants to create. So Davi, thank you so much for joining us. You couldn't be a more perfect guest for this very topic. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak about the future. And I would just add a little bit of flavor to that. You know, Tim Berners-Lee is famous for his seminal work on the web, which is basically the the ability to link together all the information. So when we talk about the future of the internet, we're really saying at the application level, uh, you move up from the infrastructure and, and ask, you know, how do you make things safe that run on top of that infrastructure as well as within the infrastructure itself? Is this problem solvable? So a lot of people in this discussion thread just announced a protocol and said, quote, redo it. So let me go through a few of those. Tony Criselius of Sony said, redesign of SMTP would be obvious. Durley G of BNY Mellon said, I would look into the failings of IPv6. And Brian Hoagley of Side Channel Security said, quote, build TCP IP with security as part of the protocols. I'm going to actually start with you, Davi. Is it okay to just think about what we've already got and say improve it, or do we even have to take a step back from that? Is, is this is this okay to be thinking this way in terms of creating a secure internet? It's okay to do both, which maybe is a wiggle answer, but we have system one and system two thinking. I often call this ICEA or ERM thinking. One is to take a step back and what are we trying to accomplish? Did we make a mistake that requires a complete rebuild? Or is there something very simple? And we often find insects are very good at the the simple. They have one task, they do it well. Bug bounties, for example, are essentially a form of insect behavior where can you find a flaw? Can we fix the flaw? Can we patch? But if there's a business logic problem where we, from the beginning, made a mistake, then sometimes we have to start over. We saw that with Telnet and SSH, for example. We burn Telnet to the ground, we replace it with SSH. But when you get to the web, we add in certificate, TLS, if you will, authentication, authorization models into HTTP. So just depends. Well, let me ask you then, of IPv6, TCP IP, and SMTP, are there any that you think need to be scrapped and started all over again, or are there, they have good foundations of which to build upon? I think they all have fairly good foundations. I mean, TCP IP is notoriously weak by nature, the fact it was designed to be open. And that's really where there's a business decision. Do you want it to be so open that it is intentionally flawed. I hate to use the word that way. But if you look at IPv6, it's a switch. And is it really a problem that IPv4 was so clever about creating private address space? Is that really, which is one of the reasons IPv6 is taking so long to adopt? Are you ready to move to a world where everything is addressable because that anonymity question comes up? So again, I I think it's really relative to people's environment. And that's the key to redesigning security is to understand that there's an absolute and a relativist view. Absolutely, we have time but we also have time zones. 
and we have gravity, but we have planets. So the question becomes, which planet are you on? So how do you design for the gravity of that unique planet? All right. Well, I'm going to throw this out to you, Alan. Do you have a, an absolute view of changing things or can you be relative? I think relativity matters here. And the reason uh, it's not it's not just the model Dobby says, but also you have to consider the economic and political aspects of all of this, too. None of this is taking place in a vacuum. This is not technology for technology's sake. This is, you know, like like I pointed out, there's privately held routers that are part of a public traffic flow, right? You can't make critical changes without considering those variables as well. So so planet Earth is most definitely a factor. All right. Well, let me bring up something that Sander Slider Inc. of ACG Technologies mentioned, and I kind of like this idea he had. He talked about, again, we're talking about things that you would change. And he said, quote, dynamic port assignments. This would reduce the assumption that one service or another would use one specific port, vastly reducing the ability to see what is using what. And also he threw out, require all gateway devices to have security protocols in place and to update regularly at no charge. This should be built in. Dobby, what do you think of Sander's suggestion? There's a lot to unpack here. I mean, first, you're talking about secret sharing when you talk about having a list of protocols that nobody knows. So how do you approach somebody that's never disclosed what protocols and which ports they're using? Somehow you have to disclose that so people can be effective at communicating. So I love this because you can have an ephemeral changing local identity that outsiders can't possibly guess because that gets rid of sort of the authoritarian, centrally controlled, centrally planned system. But then the chance of actually being able to land a packet on the right interface and have it be processed is next to nothing by design. So you can't have a world that operates like this because you'll never be able to like open uh, random anonymous communication to things that are like libraries would have to advertise some way. So it, it's again, a, an example of the balance you're going to trust certain people. And the question is, how do you do that without creating a hard, singular, trusted authority? How do you create multi-master changing or rotating more democratic models? So that's the first issue. The second issue here is if you say no charge, I mean, it, it means no charge to whom? There's someone always going to have to pay for the effort of patching, developing the patch, right. especially for old systems. So who gets reimbursed maybe as a way of looking at that. What And what is the form of reimbursement? Is it social good? Do they feel a sense of community because they contributed or do they have to get monetary recompensation? So I think it's a, a way of saying, yes, we should agree that we're going to patch the potholes, but who does it and how they account for it is going to be up in the air. All right. And Alan, your quick thought on this uh, to add to what Davi just said. Fully agreed on the dynamic ports. It becomes an identity and, and secret sharing argument. It's clever, but it would take a lot of work to figure out how to do it. And then regarding the the patching, uh, same same exact sentiment. You've got stuff on the internet that's already end of support, and you're now going back to companies, and, and maybe even in some cases, the companies don't even exist anymore. And, and you're going to somebody and you're saying, patch this ancient legacy thing to get more you know current security posture on it. Who's going to pick up the tab? Who's going to do this? How do you bully companies into obeying? And, and in the case of a company that's gone out of business, who, who could possibly be the one to do it? Right to repair. I mean, that's where it really gets interesting because if you allow, like Apple just announced this week even, that they would allow people that are not Apple to have the authority to repair in the open market. I love that because right to repair means the companies don't have to write the patches. You open up the standards and you allow other people to develop and extend the life of products indefinitely, which also allows them to be anonymous in relation to the company because they break that connection. They don't have to report back to the manufacturer in order to get a patch. Yeah, it's a return to the era of the Mac clones to a certain extent, right? It is It is refreshing to see. What are we going to do now? Paul Lanzi of Remedian said, quote, authentication of any route changes would be a good start. And Peter Vitans of New Balance adds on and says, Changing and providing a high level of security requires making identity a core part of the data flow. However, this would abandon the attractiveness of the internet to much of its user base. So this is a, another sort of balance issue, ironically, comes from a guy who works at New Balance, Davi. Where can sort of authentication play a stronger role? Because this is kind of the core of all our security problems. 
It is. But I mean, to be fair, we built authentication models around the simplest, easiest, uh, minimum viable approach, which is to have an authority assign an identity. In fact, it's sort of sad that people got rich on certificate authority models that really Let's Encrypt is a good example of how that should have been democratized from the beginning, make it free so that your identity isn't basically a, a very expensive endeavor to prove who you are. And I think what we're going to move towards away from the simplistic sort of top down model is having multiple masters and the ability to rotate. So security should have been designed from the start on the internet and particularly the web so that you could have, for example, you play a sport, soccer, football, basketball, whatever, that's an identity and you have a jersey, if you will, or you have an identity for that. You go home, you have a family identity. And the question is, how do you get that assigned to you? Within the family, there's a clear hierarchy. Within sports, there tends to be an allegiance. When you get into a country, there's obviously a national register. And maybe they even mark it out the national register so there's not one, but they have an opportunity for multiple entities to provide you your identity on behalf of the national identity register. So the future is that we allow identities to not be singular and established from a sole source, because we have a need for ephemeral localized identities instead of a permanent one that gets an authoritarian model, too much control, essentially, centralized. And then you have to back away from the authority when you don't like what they're doing or when they're getting rich, you know, enriching themselves unjustly off people's need to register an identity. Those, those are some of the economic and political issues. Would a blockchain model be appropriate then in this case where it's all decentralized? I mean, is it though really? Because ultimately blockchain has this problem of service. And that's, I think, where we come back to who wants to run it in a way that it doesn't get lost. Like if you have a hard drive failure and, and there's right. issues around, I look at blockchain like a giant spreadsheet. And so it's sort of, to me, is the same question as asking, can we survive without spreadsheets? Do spreadsheets help? Yes, they're a tool. Yes, they provide some accountability and they're making our lives easier in some sense, the way any tool would, but you don't bank on a spreadsheet in the sense that it's the determinant of the future. You use the spreadsheet the same way you use blockchain in a particular aspect of proving something. And it isn't always the right solution because you have issues of, well, speed, maintenance, availability. All right, Alan, your thoughts on identity here. Do you agree or disagree that it's kind of the core issue of our security problems? And where do you see the sort of the points of failure that could be dealt with? I think identity is key. I don't know if it's the key, but I think it is key. If you look at the corporate environments and the, and the enterprise environments and the organizational environments, you'll see that identity and access management is is more and more becoming one of the absolute key linchpins of security within that environment, right? Scaling that out to internet magnitude, Davi points out correctly, you know, you end up with more than one identity. I've got a you know, I've got different accounts on different sites. Sometimes I have more than one account on the same site. I've got more than one Gmail account. You know, as you get into the physics of multiple identity, you have to envision some sort of strategy that works almost akin to a key ring, except it's an identity ring, right? And there's challenges to be overcome to get there. Who's our sponsor this week? It's Castle. And here's Steve Prentice with more. Account takeover threats, such as credential stuffing and brute force attacks, are a major scourge to any business that maintains a database of customers that includes all their vitals. This is where Castle comes in, as Heather Howland, Vice President of Marketing, explains. Castle's user-centric approach to account security allows organizations to fully automate the threat response and account recovery in real time. So Castle understands users' identity, their behavior, and their risk in order to detect anomalies and malicious attacks. And then we can also respond with risk-based authentication and custom workflows for end-to-end -end account recovery. On the website at castle.io, there are two very compelling stories from retailers who are dealing with account takeover attacks. How did Castle help? Castle was able to remove the complexity for their security teams with an easy to use, fully automated and developer friendly solution. And this enabled them to provide stronger security while still keeping user satisfaction at the forefront. So this approach not only allowed the security team to be able to focus their time on other issues, but it also removed the need for customer support teams to get involved in the process as well. Castle's solution is SaaS based and has developer friendly SDKs and APIs that allow for easy implementation into the existing infrastructure. Castle is also very unique in that we're engaging directly with users so that they can actively participate in their own security. So they can validate their activity as legitimate or potentially malicious, and they can help with the recovery process in order to keep their account safe. Check them out at castle, C-A-S-T-L-E dot I-O. Can 
can there ever be agreement on this? So one of the issues that came up was encryption. And Tony Criselli of Sony said, so the obvious answer would be privacy, encryption. But at what layer do you implement that? And Joe Green of Iron Core Lab said, take a data-centric approach. All data would be encrypted everywhere and only readable at the point of use. That, that does sound ideal. But Jerry Perullo, uh, CISO at New York Stock Exchange, said, Almost none of the cybersecurity incidents that have made this an industry have anything to do with the interception of clear text or breaking weak encryption. It's a massive red herring. Almost all attacks of note involve identity transposition via endpoint compromise or credential threat. Now, unfortunately, we do know a lot of cases of like clear text of usernames and passwords that have been out there. So I don't know if I fully agree with Jerry's statement, but... I'm going to start with you, Alan, on this. Is encryption a red herring or not? I'm going to unpack all three in, in order here. So the first comment that privacy encryption, you know, at what layer do you implement? Obviously, the best answer from a security perspective is the lower the layer, the better. But there's challenges with that. Keep in mind the cost. Many routers simply don't even have the horsepower. So economics, again, becomes a real key factor here. Uh, regarding the idea of the data-centric approach, I think it's beautiful. I, I think data-centric is, is not a bad way to be. A lot of modern security tools and practices are definitely taking a more data-centric view. But again, you're putting a burden on, in this case, the endpoints, right? If you, if you treat it like it's all data is encrypted and the protocols themselves are simply transmitting what is already encrypted data, now you're putting a, a massive burden on the endpoints and you get things like UDP protocol. How are you possibly going to do a real true deep data encryption on a, on a streaming type protocol without massive amounts of packet loss in the case of many of the endpoint devices. So to the original statement, to your point uh, that Jerry makes regarding, you know, encryption is not a big deal. We've talked about it on the show before. Getting back to fundamentals is a really big deal. And encryption is one of those fundamentals, not sending things in the clear, storing things in the clear is there. So he's not wrong, but if the fundamentals are met, Encryption matters beyond identity, at least for interception, right? There are no good identity schemes that don't also rely on encryption to protect key moments in the identity dialogue. So there's an intertwining there as well. So the reality is that end-to-end -end encryption with identity would foil phishing of all, and, and, and all kinds of other bad things. But I think you need both. I think encryption is part of the fundamentals that you have to get back to. I think he's totally right about identity, but I want to merge the two and say encryption still matters there as well. All right, Davi, I throw this to you. Your thoughts, does encryption matter or not? Well, I got to say encryption matters. I mean, I'm not going to say it doesn't play a role because it's been proven to be so effective. Even regulators would say if you have it on, they don't want you to disclose a breach per se. Now there's strong encryption. There's lots of degrees of encryption. So it's I, not By just the way, a, I don't get the sense that Jerry say don't encrypt, but I think I'm getting the sense that obsessing that encryption would solve all the problems is not it. So I think that's more my question. What do you believe there? Okay. I mean, I'll just come out and say Jerry is 100% wrong. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> like we put SSH in place because Telnet was a dumpster fire and it absolutely was a problem to have credentials stolen on the wire and still continues to be a problem. I think what this reflects is his particular worldview. This is a good example of localization. In his world, he sees that. But you go to any disadvantaged community that has pressure for people to steal identities and a lot of those communities are very tight knit. So it's difficult for the attacker or the outsider to get in in the way he describes, to just grab identities inside the community on the hard drive or left behind tokens laying around. So from an outsider perspective, you look very much at the inner communication channels and try to grab something that you can use. So for disadvantaged communities, which I would guess that Jerry's not actively involved in, it's still a huge, huge problem. And you absolutely want to educate them about using things that protect their communication channels so they're not listened to. I think that's just fundamentally encryption is the answer there and strong encryption and key management is really the answer. I mean, I get into this all the time. I spent the last two years designing a key management solution for encryption of document-based databases. And I did that really for many reasons, but one of them was to protect people using the database against the people running the database, the service operators, the service reliability engineers sitting behind the scenes and looking at the data. So the encryption at the application or the client side on the driver level means that the authorities, the CISOs are not digging in and rooting around in people's information that they're putting into a trusted uh, cloud environment. It's, it's huge. It's absolutely essential. But what happens now is like what we're trying to do at Interrupt is a whole nother level. It's globally thinking about can you own your data? Can you have self-determination? So not only are you encrypting it, but you get to keep the keys, you get to walk away with your data, 
take it wherever you want, use it how you want, own it, you know, in the sense of GDPR. That's just not possible when you look at some of the advertising models of Google or Facebook, where they need to have all that data and see it in order to advertise to you. So it's really a going back to the roots of what the internet was supposed to be doing, which is allowing people to present themselves, but also keep control of their domains or keep control of their identities and their keys. What aspects haven't been considered? Now, what I love about this segment or some of the quotes I'm going to read here are people threw out some crazy ideas that maybe aren't so crazy. And I really like what William Fitzgerald of Johnson Controls said. He said, biomimicry, I would look to nature for inspiration and how it is self-aware, self-learning, self-configuring, self-healing, self-protecting, self-organized, social networks, and so forth. Learn from what evolved over billions of years to develop a bio-inspired cybersecure internet, efficient encoding of data, communication protocols, AI, IoT, offensive and defensive protection. So Davi, can this actually be possible? Could you create a, I guess, a secure internet that becomes more secure over time by learning through, you know, bio-inspiration? Yeah, I mean, this goes back to my AI ML presentations about learning and domain shifts. So I absolutely agree. I love this topic and I speak about it all the time, how worms can be an influence in our thinking about IoT or how viruses in the human body may be inspirational for how we should deal with malware. But the domain shift is where we run into trouble. So you can have billions of years of evolution, and then you have essentially the combustion engine and the lack of, if, if the earth had a sim right now, all the alarms would be going red saying, we're, we're seeing mass die-offs of hundreds of species. And they just said this last month that they're seeing more birds killed off than ever before in history and the planet's hotter. So evolution doesn't get you out of that paradox. You have bird species that were dominant, plentiful, and then you have essentially a sudden event, a domain shift, and they're all extinct. So yes, you can use it as inspiration, but don't expect evolution to get you out of that kind of domain shift. And that's what we're seeing with AI and ML, where if we aren't careful in security, we're going to introduce robots and not have any security, which allows them to actually cause extermination events, mass genocide. I'm going to throw in the very last comment for here from Inamur Raman of Cap Gemini, And I'm interested to know about education here, Davi. He says, quote, I would go back in time to my old school curriculum and fix what needs to be taught to school kids in terms of computer security and the internet. We see this kind of happening now where all of a sudden this is all of a sudden becoming curriculum, but it's very much patchwork. Is actually education part of this effort that you're doing? Well, absolutely. I mean, both inside Inrupt uh, as part of the practice of educating people about the right to a privacy, a human right to privacy, having a right to self-determination, where you actually get to decide what your identity in terms of the information that you've created, your entire life story, what your identity means and who gets to define that and who gets to delete it. These are things that GDPR has raised and not by coincidence from pressure of the, I would say, some of the adversarial companies, no pun intended, that are tracking you. So the education is about just generally the human rights, but also I've been asked this a lot, like, how did we end up in this place? And I try to tell people that, you know, Reagan's deregulation of content is being reversed today. Like he actively said, we should just totally deregulate and advertise whatever we want and let the market figure it out. And that led to massive harms that led to obesity. It led to diabetes. It led to all sorts of, it led to children being preyed upon by toy companies and advertisers. And so we saw very recently social networks saying, we're going to ban miracle ads because it's having a huge impact on children, particularly vulnerable populations. So you have to educate people that they should stand up for their right as a collective group, stand up for their right to not be preyed upon. It's more fundamental than trying to teach people not to click on a phishing link. It's teaching them that they should be able to go and find the source of who's trying to prey upon them and make that fundamentally illegal or agree as society that that's bad behavior. And so we saw two major shifts in America. In the 80s under Reagan, we saw the shift that said all content is okay, no matter what, no matter how poisonous or dangerous or ill effects, no matter what, we can't regulate it. And two, we saw under Gingrich, the consolidation of infrastructure, which meant far greater power spread speed. So you can poison more people more quickly. So we kind of have to think about educating children around, no, you have a right to stop something which is harmful to you. 
And you also have a right to break up the ability of one thing to poison so many people so quickly. Because if you, can, if you don't, you, you can't, this is the seed set problem. Like if, if one tiny seed can spread so much harm so quickly, then you really have to think about, are there gates or boundaries you could put in place where it would be checked? And we saw this in the 1930s, not to get too much into history, but I believe the FCC was created in 1934 by Roosevelt. FDR said, okay, enough Nazi propaganda in America in the 1930s under Hearst. We're going to put an FCC in place. We're going to prevent the consolidation of communications. Because in 1934, at the exact same time, Nazi Germany consolidated everything into one propaganda office and all content had to come from the center. And so he very actively said, no. And so educating children in the same way we educated kids about those efforts would be extremely useful. It's telling them you shouldn't have over-centralization. The market means regulation. Regulation allows it to be to flourish and innovate. And without that regulation, what we get is consolidation, monopolization, and then very little power to protect ourselves. And, and no amount of telling people not to click on links and phishing links seems to be working as well as finding the source and taking them down. Excellent point, Davi. Well, that brings us to the end of our show. I knew you would be awesome on this topic. You were great. Thank you so much. I'm going to let you talk about what you're doing with Inrup and have the closing comment. But I first want to make one comment in that to you, Alan. This post of yours generated more snark and sarcastic comments than I think I've ever seen on any post of yours before. And I'll specifically call out something that Chris Roberts of Ativo Network said per the topic of creating a new secure internet. He said, quote, we made a mistake when we moved away from pigeons. What do you think about the, the level of snark and Chris's snark uh, on this post? Chris can always bring the snark. He's, he's brilliant at it. Fundamentally, he really is actually right here. He and I were chatting in a Slack channel a while back, and I was telling him about my Wi-Fi enabled grill, and, and he just about lost it. Like, <laughs> you've got a barbecue grill with Wi-Fi. Don't be surprised when your house gets burned down by a hacker, right? <laughs> he's, uh, you know, he's, he's right. There's some real back to fundamentals, and there's some real let's stop and think through as we make each new technology decision, as we dogpile new tech and new ways of communicating onto each other. There's inherent security risk that we have to keep in mind, right? So in the case of my barbecue grill, I have it on a separate Wi-Fi network. I only enable it when I'm cooking. I have a really strong passphrase on it. It's using the latest encryption. And it's a convenience thing. It's all about convenience versus security. In this case, for me, it's handy to be able to change the grill settings from the phone while I'm prepping the rest of the meal in the kitchen. But I have to take a great amount of security precautions. And that's exactly it. As soon as you leave pigeons and you get into the internet, there's a there's a burden that comes with that that we have to address. And as we have discovered and why we're still <laughs> have an enormous security industry today. I want to thank our sponsor again. That is Castle. They did an awesome job. Davi, do you have any last thoughts or anything you'd like to say about uh, what you're doing at Inrum? And more importantly, we ask all our guests, are you hiring? <laughs> yes, of course we're hiring. We're growing very fast and I'm open to any and all position people want to be talking to me about. Happy to introduce them, especially in terms of engineering. We're developing quite a lot of code very quickly and standards. If you want to get involved in designing the future of the web or the next web, if you will, happy to have you come and have a discussion with us. Since you mentioned pigeons, passenger pigeons, I mean, that's history to me. So I can't help but say, you know, they were the most abundant bird in North America and possibly even the world in the 1800s. Yet by 1915, they were extinct, completely wiped out. These huge flocks that made them especially safe, right? They were safety flocks. The numbers kept them safe, made them vulnerable. So there's a perfect example of domain shifts where all of a sudden the train and the telegraph were introduced. And so hunters could go right to where the big flock was and just eliminate it completely, destroy it completely. So with no habitat to regenerate because of development, they were just decimated within you know, 100 years. So 1915, 1916, that was it for them. Even though they were extremely intelligent and adapt and developed, the biology was you know, evolved for so long that they were basically impervious up into the domain shift. Now, to get into the point of interrupt, this is where it gets interesting because if you look at that as a tragedy, which obviously it is, you know, environmental tragedy, you also might think, well, is there a lesson there about something that's so large you can't get at it. Facebook, for example, just seems so large. How is anyone ever going to go after an entity that becomes so large? And then you think about the domain shift and you realize the train and the telegraph were a form of portability. They're a form of self-determination. People could move about and go to the place they were needed in order to apply the, the skills they had. And that fundamentally, when we're talking about the future, we're talking about that portability, that 
determination of where your data should live. You, as an identity, should live on the internet. So if you can pull your data out of whatever, LinkedIn, Airbnb, all these services, and put it into some other service, or even more accurately, if you can host in some independent space that's really yours, your identity and all of your data, and then allow access to it from applications, that's a much more sensible model. So the same way the web server originally, when the web was invented, allowed people to come to your page and see you, and then eventually that shifted into this crazy consolidated model where all the power was held by these people who wanted to use it for advertising. If you think about that, data on a web server becomes data for all applications. You're really talking about the type of technology domain shift that makes it possible for you know Davids to take on the Goliaths. Well, Davi, thank you very much. And uh, I love this conversation. Alan, back me up on this, yes? Good stuff. Good stuff as always. I love chatting with Davi. It was great to run into you in New York. Thank you again for being on the show. If you have not heard the other episode that Davi was on about machine learning failures, it was also awesome, just like this one is. I want to thank uh, everybody for their comments and their suggestions on how to create a more secure internet. Don't hesitate to always contribute to great posts that you see, mostly by Alan. And if you see a great discussion anywhere, please let me know because that could become the topic of a future episode of Defense In Depth. And also, let me also mention that we are now on Reddit, which we hadn't been before. We are CISO Series on Reddit. Just go to CISO Series, that subreddit, and join. And uh, we are going to try to get discussion going there as well. And we will have an Ask Me Anything, an AMA, coming up soon with all the members of the CISO Series. So stay tuned. Thank you again for listening and participating in Defense In Depth. We've reached the end of Defense In Depth. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss yet another hot topic in cybersecurity. This show thrives on your contributions. Please write a review, leave a comment on LinkedIn or on our site, CISOseries.com, where you'll also see plenty of ways to participate, including recording a question or a comment for the show. If you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, contact David Spark directly at david at CISOseries.com. Thank you for listening to Defense In Depth.